Welcome everyone um, to this session with Ms. Claire Chang and Mr. Ho Kwon Ping. Uh, we're really excited to have them here today um, joining us together. Um, and for those of you who do not know them, um, Mr. I'll start with some brief introductions. Um, Mr. Ho Kwon Ping, um, who we'll be referring to as KP, is the founder of Banyan Tree Holdings which is an international hospitality brand that manages and develops resorts, hotels, and spas around the world. Um, he is also the chairman of Laguna Resorts and Hotels, executive chairman of Taiwan Public Company, um, founding and current chairman of the Board of Trustees of Singapore Management University and chairman of the Singapore Summit. Um, he's won a slew um, of awards for his contributions and accomplishments in the hotel industry um, and has always also been decorated with um, service medals and the Distinguished Service Order by the Singapore government, among many other awards. And Claire um, is co-founder with KP and current senior vice president of Banyan Tree Holdings, as well as chairperson for the China business development sector. Um, she was one of the first two women to be admitted to the Singapore Chinese Chamber of Com Commerce and Industry in 1995, and also served as nominated member of parliament for two terms from 1997 to 2001. Um, she's been a strong advocate for issues such as education and gender inequality and holds positions of leadership in many organizations focused on these issues. Um, and she has also won numerous national and international business awards and was inducted into the Singapore Women's Hall of Fame in 2018. Um, so we're really honored to have this power duo um, with us here today. Um, thank you for so much for taking the time to be with us here today, KP and Claire. Oh, you're welcome. But you know, when you give our CVs, that goes to show, um, you know, the older you are, the longer your CV becomes. <laughs> <laughs> yes, definitely. Um, and briefly for our audience today, um, we'll start with a um, pretty long section of moderated Q&A with KP and Claire, and then we'll move to some of your questions. Um, so throughout um, the session, feel free, whether you're live streaming in from Hopin or joining us live on the Zoom, feel free to put your questions in whichever chat um, the platform you're on is in um, and upvote your fellow delegates questions and we'll get to as many as possible at the end. Um, so with that, we will jump right into it. Um, before we talk about both of the work that you guys have done in your entrepreneurial careers, I um, would love to talk a little bit about your backgrounds. Um, I know both of you have some quite interesting stories from your childhood um, that would love if you could share with our audience today. Um, so just curious to hear about how each of your upbringings has shaped your core values today in both your professional career and personal life. Um, and what are some of the biggest lessons you might have learned growing up that you still carry with you today and have subsequently made an effort to instill to your own children? Um, Mr. Hove uh, or KP, if we want to start with you, um, that'd be great. Well, I, I guess um, since growing up, I've, I've imbued with a, a sense of questioning everything. And that even became the title of a book I wrote called Asking Why. Mm -hmm. Often said that that's been the cause for whatever moderate success uh, we've had because we question orthodoxy and status quo of the business world, et cetera. It's also caused me a lot of problems, getting jailed in the US, getting banned from the US, getting jailed in Singapore and so on. And it's been quite important um, as a value I've upheld with our own children um, mm -hmm. to the extent that they've asked so many questions at dinner tables, I've had to actually break my own rule and just answer, you know, shut up and eat your meal. <laughs> but they have, I think to, to the extent that, you know, they question the world around them. It doesn't mean to be a rebel by any means. You can question the world and still come to accept what is the, the, the accepted norms. But I think it's important to, as young people, not just take what has been given to you, whether it's your religion, whether it's your the values of your parents. It's important to question everything and then to arrive at what your conclusions are. So that's been one important value that I've upheld for myself and, and for our children. I guess the other one is, is to have a purposeful life. Um, that's what's motivated Claire and I throughout our lives. And we've had you know, quite a lot of different careers, as, um, myself as a journalist and as a business person and presumably a hotelier and then as a 
you know, and so on and so forth. But and I and I think careers are not important. You morph from one career to another, but uh, and money, of course, is is good to have, but it's not the end all and be all. But I think having purpose and what you do is so critical, um, not only for young people but older people, people nearing retirement like like ourselves, getting into our seventh decade. If you don't have a purpose in life after you think you've retired, then life just shrivels up and, and you just sort of die quickly. So those two things, asking a lot of questions, questioning everything until you are satisfied with the answers for yourself, and then always having a purpose in life. I think those are probably the two most important values for me. Yeah, absolutely. Very wise words of advice. Um, and we'll definitely talk, um, or would love to hear more about this story um, about your time um, spending time in jail um, a little bit later in the conversation. I'm sure there's some very interesting experiences there um, to discuss. Um, but yeah, Claire, would love to hear your perspective as well. Uh, I know you had a pretty unique situation growing up, um, being um, in a big family and the only daughter of six children. Um, so curious about how this might have shaped um, you as a person um, and growing up with many brothers. Um, yeah, just its impact on you. Um, yeah, I, I think I think KP and I grew up in a very different way. I grew up in Singapore. He grew up in Thailand. I studied in Singapore. He studied in America. Sometimes I feel that there's a clash of civilization so far. But the fact that we have both survived 44 years of our marriage this year. Unimaginable. Shows, unimaginable. Sometimes <laughs> even impossible. But it therefore shows that there is convergence. And what would that be? You know, KP said about purpose. And I think that that has been what so-called unified us. My childhood was in little India. I, I grew up clearly feeling, living the multicultural diversity. So I learned very early from my grandparents and mother about inclusiveness, because I had to deal with Malays and the Indians and the Chinese all around me. I learned what is community building. I learned about what is patient and tolerant growing up with five male brothers older than me, always grabbing the food first, and five male cousins who are, who are younger mm -hmm. than me, whom I need to be the big sister to. So growing up with 10 boys and in little India in a multicultural setting had been tremendous in shaping my sense mm -hmm. of uh, uh, diversity and inclusiveness. And that's what I feel had delighted my journey because I meet with so many different people different walks of life, even in the way we deal with business, is always to look at diversity and inclusiveness as important values. And I believe in therefore teamwork. I, I, I don't feel you put us as founders of Binary. I think the, the success of Binary is really the work of teams, many mm -hmm. different teams from all over the world, where right? divide into so many different clusters. And I appreciate mm -hmm. that. And I, I'm very comfortable with crowds because of my childhood, having grown up in a very crowded area in a two-room apartment, dealing with all this diversity, made me, I feel, more um, patient and tolerant person. I'm more open-minded. And that has been a very valuable resource that I, I'm continually learning. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, very incredible to um, hear about. And I think this idea of diversity and inclusion that you talk about um, is something that has really shown through throughout the rest of your career. Um, would love to touch on that later and all the initiatives that you've been involved with there. Um, but before we get to more of your professional careers, um, KP would love to hear a little bit more about um, some of your experiences in your young years, especially in college. Um, I know you mentioned briefly while you were in the United States. Um, for those of you who don't know, um, he was studying at Stanford and had a quite a unique experience protesting the Vietnam War. Um, and actually, I think looking back, um, while most people would probably be negatively impacted by some of these experiences, you seem to have a fairly positive outlook. Um, so curious to hear about what your mindset was there um, and how you were able to see this in a positive light, um, despite the turmoil that might have been going on around you. Well, well, I, I guess, first of all, I was kicked out of Stanford, went to jail um, in, in Santa Clara. Maybe if I'd gone to Harvard, uh, maybe I wouldn't have been thrown out. Maybe <laughs> liberal. So that's what I have to suffer for, for having gone to a second rate university like Stanford and not the Harvard. <laughs> um, but, but, you know, it's a long story. I don't want to get into the story about getting expelled, getting, getting kicked out of Stanford. I mm -hmm. think was what has been useful of that experience and, and note that I was, I think I was, I was about 20 at that time. So 
pretty young. Yeah. Uh, that was the first time I've actually encountered an experience where you have to, where I made a decision which was a very difficult decision, but a right decision. Um, because I would act, actually accept it into Cornell, into other universities, and, and it was a much easier thing to do gallivanting around the life of a you know student activist. There's a lot of yeah, there's a lot of nice things about it too, to be sort of, you know, featured around as an activist and so on. Uh, but and, and I was very attracted to go on to do that. Uh, coming back to Singapore would, would have meant I would have gone to a country which I was a national of, but I'd never lived in at all. Uh, it would have been immediately thrown into national service, which was two and a half years of working in the army, which I didn't really want to do at all. And I remember the long walks I had by myself at uh, Lagunita Drive near where the dorm was in Stanford and where mm -hmm. the, the two parts of you, the part that wants to do what is the easier thing and better thing to do, the easier thing to do. And then there's a part of you that is looking down on yourself, which then tells you what is the honest thing to do. And honest thing to do, which would have made all the difference, would make all the difference one way or the other. And you would not know at 20 years old, whether going back to a totally alien place like Singapore, going into the army in Singapore, what that would have meant to a life that was before then a very clear path um, of course, making that, that decision ultimately was absolutely the right thing to do for one important reason. That was how I got to meet Claire. Uh, mm -hmm. We would not have met. But I think I, I do say these when I talk to young people about mindfulness in making decisions. That at every point in your life when you encounter a decision, try to be mindful, meaning try to step outside of yourself. Look down upon yourself while you're making a decision and start to visualize what you would be like 10 years from now if you made decision A, made decision B, and so on. So the, the whole point of all that, why has been positive for me was obviously because of the result of all that was positive. I am now, I'm glad I made that decision. But the lesson to be learned for younger people is that these decisions you make constantly in your life, less dramatic manners than getting thrown out of university, but you make constant decisions and you always have to be mindful that when you make a decision, you're branching off into another direction that is critical to your life and make these decisions with a lot of mindfulness as to what is the right thing to do, what is your inner self telling you to do rather than the outer self, which is, which is very noisy because there's lots of other things influencing you. Although I must add though, KP, uh, when we were 22 and 23, like all these college students, I don't think we were that clear about what we are going to do. No, in five years. So not at all clear, but, but I say this too, in, in, because of, I'm, I chair SMU now and I see a lot of young people now graduating at a time of, of COVID-19. And, and honestly, this is the worst crisis. It's yeah. a generation defining crisis, the worst since World War II. I see so many young people who are being thrown out into the job market with, with absolutely no surety what the world is going to look like. And all the talk about how the whole world is going to be digitalized, et cetera, is fine and good. But when you're a young person yeah. in life, it's very difficult. And, and yeah. what I wanted to say was that I think when you're young in life, making a decision like that, make it with your inner self talking to you, not yeah. your outer self, which is influenced by parents and so on. Uh, young as they are, I kind of feel that, you know, don't put the bird so much pressure on, on being mindful sometimes. I, I like to use the word mindful as the power of the mind. It means it's the power of thinking, the way of viewing the world, the way of understanding the world. For me, it's more mindful. Making decisions, I think, is progress. It comes with time. You may not know it, don't get alarmed. You may not have the decision, don't be afraid. But seizing the power of your mind to imagine, to create, that I feel is the first step. I would even use the word to be mindless, mindless. People always think it's pejorative. Sometimes we look, we look towards thinking of the, the thinking so much, we forgot the emotions. We forgot about our feelings. There are people who want us, you know, children to become doctors, but they really want to be an artist. So pursuing the purpose and passion is sometimes not something that that you are mindful about it's something good to do, but you really don't want to do it. So I'll tell you to be mindless about it, but look at your emotions. 
And, and the third word on the mind is about mind setting. I think this post COVID is really about resetting the mind towards many more different opportunities. As, as KP said, you know, we, we need to think, we need to feel, I need to reset away from what has been traditionally been known for. And ask yourself, what do you want? So I could only ask a 22 year old, you have the whole life ahead of you, live it, find it, you know? And if you can't make a decision now, don't worry. It will come a time you will know. But whenever you seize that power of thinking as yours and you feel it, you'll be fine. Angel, you have a, you have a theme now for debate between Claire and mine. <laughs> that would be, should we be mindless or mindful? Great question. Yeah. <laughs> yep, yep, yep. <laughs> Mine is not mindless, so it's mind hyphen less. Okay. Mind it's a nuance. <laughs> nuance. Yeah. Mine is yeah. mind hyphen full. <laughs> we think too much, you know, and we're not <laughs> feeling enough, and we're not being emotional. The EQ is totally lacking in what I see in the world today. That's why I wanted to say <laughs> I'll talk about it. Yes, yes. I think I think both of your pieces of advice have been um, I don't know, very inspiring for me to hear um, from your perspective. Um, and yeah, definitely um, would love to touch on um, the impact that COVID-19 has had on Banyan Tree, on your guys' personal, um, on your own lives as well um, in the future. Um, but on this potential, I don't know, debate between the two of you on decision-making, mindfulness versus mind, mindlessness, um, uh, very curious to hear about um, a brief story behind Banyan Tree. Um, I know neither of you actually entered into the world of entrepreneurship until um, KP, your, your career in journalism, and Claire, um, you had a career in academia. Um, curious about what ultimately inspired you guys to found Banyan Tree, um, why you were intrigued by this idea of a business, particularly this hospitality group, um, and where you derived this courage or inspiration to found it together um, and leave the current careers you guys had already built up. Okay, maybe I'll go first and then I'll talk about my journey and then Claire can talk about uh, hers with Bantry Gallery and with sure. you know, all that. Um, as, as, you, if you, as you've just mentioned, uh, both of us are not business people. Um, it, we trained, I was trained in development economics in Claire and development sociology. Uh, the word there, of course, is development. So in the 1970s, the issue of poverty in the third world um, the, the, and, and development was a very big issue, raising Asia out of poverty, how can we do so, et cetera. I mean, that was the big, uh, the vision and the idealism of young people of our generation because of the poverty in the third world. So we were very into development. I became a journalist. Mm -hmm. I was, a, uh, was an academic when we got married and so on. Um, and, and essentially, I got into the family business because I'm the eldest son. Um, mm -hmm. My father had a stroke. We were living on Lama Island, and the village we were living in was called Yongshi Wan, which is Banyan Tree Bay. That's how we got the name for it later on. Um, but we were living, you know, hardly, we were not, we didn't have enough money to even afford to live on Kowloon or Hong Kong Island. So we had to live in a fishing village, which was the best decision of our lives because it was such an idyllic life, though it was hardly a rich life. But essentially, I, I had to join, I, I volunteered to join the family business when I, my father had a stroke. So I was in that business for about 10 years. And that was the sort of, prototypical Asian conglomerate, meaning it was a jack of all trades, master of none. We were contract manufacturers for everybody, making things cheaply like everybody else. I mean, the whole, anybody who, who, who's in your audience who has got, studied any bit of economic development theory would have known that contract manufacturing is a, is a dead end. We had no brand. We just made things for other people from shoes to TV sets and, and so on. Mm -hmm. So. So in, in the, when, when we reached, when I reached about 40 years old, uh, a few things happened that made me realize this was a dead end. And purely as a fluke, we were, my brother, who's an architect, uh, myself and Claire went to Phuket Island, and we thought of buying a, a piece of land for a second home. We bought that little piece of land, and then we chanced across a much bigger piece of land. And not having been trained in business, not having a Harvard MBA, I never heard of the word due diligence. We just thought, well, this looks kind of cool. 
it was a moonscape. Yeah, it was completely polluted by tin mining, which we didn't know anything about. But as a lark, we said, let's find the price. It was dirt cheap because it was absolutely polluted and useless. We bought it and then saddled with this burden afterwards, we decided to develop it. And that became the start of our CSR sustainability efforts. Mm -hmm. We had no choice but to rehabilitate a total wasteland back to life again. And that was how we began to realize that tourism is really a double-edged sword. You can do terrible things to the environment and to cultural environment, economic environment, physical environment through tourism. You can also rehabilitate so many things and, and bring development to communities through tourism. So we basically built the first hotel, somebody else managed it, second hotel, somebody managed it, third hotel, nobody wanted to manage it because they had no beach. And again, being young and, and ignorant, and ignorance is bliss, um, we said, you know, bingo, Eureka, a light bulb struck and said, why don't we do our own brand? Because I'd always said we needed a brand. That was a birth of Banyan Tree. And from there, a lot of things have happened. We've grown the brand. We are both not professional hoteliers, though we love to backpack, but it's not the idea of luxury that drives us. It's the idea of community. It's the idea of pride and um, self-pride in providing service to people and not being subservient when you're doing it. Um, it's about intimacy, romance, all these values that have made Banyan Tree and the seven other brands we have now brought on board um, since we created Banyan Tree. I think that's, that's basically how it started. We're all, we were accidental hoteliers, but sometimes being amateur about something, but passionate about it gives you an advantage because you love what you're doing and you're not, you're not burdened by all the, the, uh, the wisdom and, and, you know, processes of the past. You are free to do new things. So that's how I got started in it. Um, and of course, Claire had a completely different journey, which is, which is very inspiring about um, this lady that, that we, we knew and how she inspired Claire into craft work and how Bantry Gallery is now what it is today. I think our journey in entrepreneurship is really quite organic. I mean, we are both academics. We were even thinking of going to INSEAD for a postgraduate degree. We were thinking about traveling around the world with a backpack and just write and teach. I was a teacher, yeah? So in that sense, really, we are accidental entrepreneurs. We are, it is organic. Um, and I think what, what unify our, both our mindfulness is the notion of value creation, more so than what we think entrepreneurship is about, is about mm -hmm. wealth creation. And when I chanced upon this um, a lady called Shireen Foster, who is a Parsi and a Baha'i, who brought two cushions to me and tell me that two cushions in the village in Sukhothai in North Thailand can help to bring a child to school, a girl child to school. I thought, well, if I buy 200 cushions, it's 200 children. And if I buy 2,000 cushions and furnish the whole hotel with it, I'm creating a community. So growing up in Singapore in this diverse background and then learning that a business model can be developed that support an entire village of women and children to get a better life. That is the new idea of what I see as a, a promising role of business. So it is that, that inspiration of seeing that, you know, Bionetry Gallery can be the interface between community and business that entrants and, and, and me. And then I got deeper into it. I started to look at craft villages, look at how women work, and how they could be, could stay in the villages, uh, produce the handiwork, and I can be mm -hmm. that little man to be the market uh, pl platforms for them without, without having to get the middle man uh, coming in, that profit from them. So in, in that sense, how I got into it, a chance encounter and the inspiring business model and setting up the buy and treat gallery that became business. We now have about 70 over retail outlets in all our hotel and continuing looking at cottage industry, women empowerment, village support, and innovative technology to produce the craft work. For me, that is the business model that, that excited me. So I feel that we are creating value and we also see 
in our effort as um, becoming a powerful force for the positive change. Little ways maybe, but tourism has that promise to create positive change. And craft development has the positive role of creating value for the villagers. That was what I've learned the last 30 years and, and feel delighted by it. And from that on, we moved on to other issues that deal with sustainability, protecting the coral reefs, looking at the, uh, the, um, the, the, um, uh, the, the, whether it is the ocean or the forest, because what we are doing and what we are doing wrong may be robbing our children for their sustainable future. That two tenants, sustainability and craft for me, has been how I got into the business. Of course, afterwards, you know, one thing leads to another, you sharpen up your abilities and then you realize that you could do more than just doing craft and sustainability. And then you could export this to other geographies. And that's how I then got into China business development because I realized that people suddenly find the need for meaning in business development and sustainability and craft development become the twin uh, pillars that help motivate our whole um, development journey. And people like that narrative. Yes, yes, absolutely. I think it's very inspiring to hear how um, you both talk a lot about this idea of finding value in creating these hotels and the, the finding value um, in craftsmanship. Um, and both of you mentioned um, pretty extensively this idea of sustainability, um, which we would love to dive into um, in a bit. I'm very curious to hear a little bit more um, about um, how you've seen Banyan Tree grow over these past few decades. Um, and the impact that you think it's had. Um, and also um, going into the current situation, um, what this pandemic might've um, taught you about resiliency and flexibility, both for your own lives and for the company as a whole. Um, I know it must have been a pretty big hit to the hospitality sphere um, with a lot of travel being limited. And KP, you mentioned um, one of the biggest crises um, in your opinion since World War II. So um, would love to hear about um, what you've learned as a company throughout this time and how it's maybe affected your leadership, how you've kept the company strong um, throughout such a challenging period of time. Well, the, I mean, the, um, the cliche that, that um, uh, what doesn't kill you only makes you stronger is literally for COVID-19. Um, thankfully, we haven't ourselves, um, you know, caught the virus. But uh, many of our colleagues have. Some actually didn't make it. Um, but it's it's really true that that statement, that cliche about resilience, that as a company, we've gone through a period where we might not have made it. Um, we have. We're now in a very comfortable position to withstand the rest of the crisis, no matter how many further Delta or other outbreaks occur. But it's not as if you know we are in a happy situation. Huh? We're still in a big loss situation, but in terms of cash flow, which is the big mantra now, it's cash flow, cash flow, cash flow, nothing to do with profitability. Our cash flow is very healthy, so we're okay. We're past that crisis. But it's been a very painful journey. Um, I, had, I had thought that being in the hospitality industry, event risk is probably the biggest risk that we have compared to many other industries. We have, you know, political risk. You just need a coup d'etat and people don't travel anymore. You just need a tsunami as hit as the Asian tsunami hit our, our projects and people don't travel anymore. And I had never thought we would have a, a health pandemic, a health risk such as the, this pandemic, which has completely everyone. And we even thought the end of the, the this, this nightmare was around the middle of this year when everything was going to, and now of course this new Delta outbreak has, has come. So it's, it's, you know, we're being hit blow after blow after blow. And resilience is critical and maintaining mental health is so critical at this time. We had adopted as our corporate values, a slogan which Claire originated, which we've rolled out into all our training for people as core to our service culture. But it's become even more important now, not as just the core value for our service culture. It's the value that underpins 
everything that we're doing now at a time of pandemic. And that is the slogan, I am with you. I am with you defines what we mean by service culture, that we're not subservient to other people. I do not serve you. I'm with you. I understand you're celebrating a birthday. I celebrate it for you. I understand if you're grieving, I will also as a service provider understand where you're coming from. That we started pre-pandemic. Now I'm with you is has taken on a totally different meaning. It's 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 the meaning for our own leadership people towards all the rest of our associates that we are with you. We are with you. and sometimes we are with you. It doesn't mean we can help you because we've had to lay off a lot of people. Uh, it's been a very painful exercise. I'm with you means I know where you're coming from. I understand your pain, even though I may not know anything about it. So this whole very, very difficult period has made us a lot more thoughtful, a lot more grateful for the, for the things in life we need and should be grateful for, like family, precious time with people, and so on. And I think we are emerging out of this stronger as an institution. Now, of course, in terms of business opportunities, there are also many. That's when you become a little bit more crass, so to speak. You actually outline opportunities, you list it on your whiteboard. And, and for us, for example, one clear opportunity is the fact that being a relatively strong Asian brand, and so many Asian owners have hotels, but they have no brands, they're coming out of this whole pandemic realizing that they need an international brand. So we are in mm-hmm. to go to them and say, hey, let us manage your properties. You know, so so there's lots of business opportunities you can line up and list out, which we do, of course, in a very cold manner, meaning, you know, if the other guy is suffering, we can profit from it by helping them out. Those are business opportunities. Um, but very, very importantly is the emotional, um, the emotional side of things that we have to be very, very um, attuned to, both in terms of guests who come to our hotels. They're not here. I mean, I don't know about the West. I, I see in, you know, pictures of Florida, in Fort Lauderdale. I see in pictures in, in Southern Spain where, you know, young people are going crazy uh, with celebrating the end of uh, the pandemic. But I think in this part of the world, the return to tourism is a lot slower and therefore a lot more um, um, pensive in terms of people wanting to go out and, and enjoy themselves again. And so we are, we are taking advantage of that. But as an institution as a whole, I think we will be not only stronger in terms of uh, our cutting costs, our being leaner, our being more resilient. Those are the measurable things. I think the non-measurable part is we become a much closer uh, community of people within the company itself. I've often been asked, you know, by people, how do you survive this uh, marriage with KP? And I told them disruption and volatility, which are exactly the two words we are also using for COVID. Mm-hmm. So I'm trained in disruption <laughs> and, uh, you, know, you know, when I was courting him, I had to read about all his mishaps in the jail and all that, you know, in newspapers. And then we moved house 11 times to different locations to do different things. Every three years, there are always changes. So I'm actually quite at peace with the notion of resilience. So in a way, these two COVID years, I I think it is loss and gain. When there's loss, there's gain. When there's, there's, you know, that there is, we are recovering slowly, but the two years have given us the opportunity to discover so many different things. For, for, for in what I'm doing now in Bayantri uh, Management Academy, like KP will talk about I'm with you culture that we're teaching. In one unit of time, I'm connected to four different geographies. We we'll never do that before. We got into Teams, we got into Zoom, we are able mm-hmm. to connect. So here it is, the overcoming and resilience from the day of my courtship to now, I realized that we, we, we can't be in control all the time. And we never knew at any one time what may be the perfect progress. But well, I think what I admire about um, KP and the work he has done for the company, it's the sense of responsibility to the people. We cannot quit. The sense of prudence 
in managing the finance so that we will always have our head above water. And best of all, it's the sense of hope. He's the most optimistic and joyful guy that I know. Even at the pits of time, he sees the vision and the promise that, that it's always possible. And we are all, you know, have geared up to get there. I think that our past and the way we grew up as, as a baby boomers generation, where we saw nation building years, him in Thailand and me in Singapore, where we lived with scarcity. I grew up with the one million people in Singapore, and now we are six billion. We, grew, we queued up for water. We didn't even have water. We, we, had, we had curfews, we had racial riots. There's so many things that we, we had to do to just survive, survive. So in a way, I feel that both of us as baby boomer gen generations, we do care about um, responsibility, about prudence, about conservation, about sustainability. Those were the values that drive us. And I think that seats us well, these two years, so we never gave up. It is the pits because of tourism, but we didn't give up. We continue to look at the next possibility. Yes, travel is going to be slow, but all the more we have to create a new notion of how people like to travel, the way they like to travel. We have to create products and services that, you know, post-COVID. I think that's the fun part, and that is also an exciting part. Again, that is, again, looking at value creation and looking at creativity and innovation. And that, I think, our group, we have plenty of, and that is what keeps us going. So for all young people out there, I think this has been the most difficult time for you, for sure. And you might even just see some black tunnel. But if you continue to, you know, you know be, be at it, there will be a door that will open. There will be a window where cool breeze will come in. But you have to be that agency to take charge. We have been keeping, I have gone through the ups and downs in the last 40 years in our marriage, in, in our business and, in, and all. But as long as we stay together hand in hand, and as long as we are mindful of energy and creativity, we will find a new possibility. And I hope the next five years, we will see all the new opportunities as well for travel, and it will be good. So we are now talking about building back better, and therefore we're spending the years, we're getting out, fortifying our group of associates with a more powerful mind in the way they see the world, the way they feel about themselves, the way they would like to uh, build back better for themselves and their families. Yes, absolutely. I think that's really insightful advice. Um, as you mentioned, for a lot of our young delegates in the audience today, um, who are either first starting their careers or about to start um, and enter their careers in this very unique period of time. Um, and Claire, you mentioned on um, really inspiring and guiding your team. I'm curious to hear about how the two of you um, really lead Bonnie and Tree um, as a group and on the note of leadership. Um, some of your core principles as a leader, um, I know you mentioned having very strong values, um, but how you ultimately guided your team to effectively adapt to new situations such as COVID-19 right now um, and how you kept that team motivated. Um, yeah, um, in very high leadership positions. Yeah. Um, we have spent a lot of time looking at leadership talking about how people lead and what's leadership style and what are the leadership qualities. There are tons of books out there. I'm a lot more now uh, in, the, in the thinking mode of looking at ground level, because I think the success of other organizations is really people, especially in tourism, is the frontline people, because they are the ones to get to be in touch with the guests. And therefore, a lot more investment of time, resources, has to be ground up so we are shift, I'm shifting because of being chair of learning and development for the group now. I'm looking mm -hmm. at how to create the structures and the processes, as well as the curriculum, to look at empowering people from ground up. So that there must be multi-pronged, multi-track leadership training. But leadership is not just about being the CEO or the president. Leadership is about you leading yourself the way you think, feel. It's about leading others. It's about team motivation. Mm -hmm. It's about working at team culture mm -hmm. and leading organizations is to be, to, be mm -hmm. uh, to know where the industry goes and to follow or to innovate. 
So I think there are many, many levels of, of, of doing a training. And also we found the new uh, uh, pedagogy, you know, how adults learn are very different from how children learn. So we are now doing a lot more interactive, action-packed workshopping for people to discover the way they think, how they should think, how they feel in their learning journeys. So I think motivation cannot be just a, a, a creed or a um, mission statement or a charismatic leader contribution alone. It really is millions of hours of slow, steady and continuous strategic engagement ground up and pop down across horizontals, between business units, across geographies to promote an integrated perspective to work with. And I think with 60 over nationalities within our group, with about 9,000 associates, with 60 over nationalities, who are we? We are not Singaporean company, we are not a Thai company, we are diverse. Hence, one of our culture tagline is differences do matter. We respect them and we're not afraid of that. The important thing is we find our common core, the way we operate, the Banyan way. And that I think motivates all the different colors, ages, gender, and, and sexual orientations within our group. We are not afraid of differences. We engender, we, we, we integrate, but we are all held together as a big finance family, family with our core values. Can I look at that from a different perspective? I think Claire is completely correct that leadership is not about top down, the CEO level. It's at every level. If you're a leader, um, our restaurant manager is a leader, our assistant supervisor of housekeeping is a leader. So long as you have responsibility and accountability for more than yourself, you already are a leader. So that's one very important perspective we have. The other one, and perhaps I, I, I focus on it a bit more because I'm, I'm chairing a university called Singapore Management University, is the issue of leadership versus management. I remember one leadership conference I went to where some big shot multinational CEO defined leadership as the art of maximizing, the, getting the most people to do the most things in the most productive manner. And I disagreed with him because I said, that's a definition of good management. How do you maximize the resources for the most optimal results? That's management. What is the difference between leadership and management? And, and to me, leadership is basically the ability to inspire people to aspire beyond yourself. So if you're a restaurant manager, you have to manage the restaurant, right? I mean, that's clear. That's good management or bad management. How do you lead them then to in how do you inspire them to aspire beyond themselves? You have to show them that what, they, what, what work they do is important for their families. You have to show them that what they do makes a difference for the guests who come in, who come and celebrate an anniversary at the restaurant. You have, to, you have to inspire people so that the people who you inspire are not just motivated to do good management practices, they, they see some aspiration there. Now, we all know about religious leaders, right? I mean, that's what they're supposed to do. They inspire you to aspire beyond your normal self, to think about religion and this and that. And political leaders are supposed to do this and that and so on. But, and business leaders now are supposed to also inspire people to do sustainable practices, et cetera. But my point is leadership, which is that ability to inspire people to work harder because of their families, because they, they want the group to succeed. That unit may be a restaurant, it may be a housekeeping unit, it can be your any small team. But leadership is clearly much different from management. I wouldn't say one is important than the other. You could be a great leader, be a terrible manager, and the whole your whole unit would collapse. You could be a great manager but you inspire nobody at all. And they just are a very great, mac, uh, you know, maximizing productivity unit, but everybody hates you or they find that you are basically useless. So I think that ability to inspire someone to go beyond what they do for a wage and for a living wage, et cetera, they, they come out of themselves and do become the best of themselves. That is real leadership. And that's what we try to tell people that, 
You don't have to be a buddy CEO or president of a country. You need to lead at your level because inspirational leadership is critical at every level of an institution. I think to lead to inspire and inspire to aspire, it's been really the crux of the work that we are doing in, in the management academy. And every associate that joins our group actually has a handbook and that handbook is titled Walk the Talk. It's not enough to just talk about leadership or to just be inspirational alone, but it is walking the dot yourself so that you can exemplary to others that they see you doing it, they will follow suit and they walk it. It is in walking and in doing that you really feel the inspiration and then you discover your aspiration as well. So I really think that, you know, inspire to aspire as someone has written into the chat box, it's really a great uh, lesson point. It reminds me, you've got a lot of questions. Do you want to deal with some of these now? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so we'll try to get to as many as possible. Um, I think, yeah, uh, this note of leadership is very important. Um, I think you guys both offer very, very, very um, insightful perspectives. Um, <clears throat> And you did mention a lot this idea of sustainability um, and as leaders um, just pioneering pioneering these other branches of Bonnie and Tree as the years have gone on. Um, I know you guys have the Bonnie and Tree Global Foundation, um, which focuses on this idea of corporate social responsibility um, and is driven by this idea of embracing the environment, empowering people. Um, and just curious why this idea of corporate social responsibility um, is so important to you two and to Bonnie and Tree as a whole um, throughout these decades that you've been working with Bonnie and Tree um, and more specifically with sustainability, um, why this idea of sustainability is so urgent um, and important today and something you guys care so deeply about. Um, there's quite a few questions from the audience regarding sustainability, um, regarding the key factors of driving sustainable tourism today across communities um, and how young people can play their their own part in promoting and contributing to this shared agenda. Um, so would love to hear both of your insights on this topic. Yeah. I should start on this one and then KP, you can add on. I don't think we knew the word corporate social responsibility when we first started. Mm -hmm. Neither did we talk about sustainability in such cogent manner. I think because we are children, we are baby boomer generation, as I said earlier. And that what we grew up in a way that understand uh, economic development and the importance of your own sense of responsibility to the planet. Because there's no planet B. So we need to do good to planet A. And then over time, I think it's an organic growth in our own sense of understanding what it entails. That is not just about saving the uh, orangutans or the environment. It is really embedding the notion of sustainability to the way we operate whether it is electricity or it is water or it is rubbish or it is waste or it is um, community outreach. We learn over the last 30 years that business thrives when community survives and thrives. We will only su be successful if we take care of ecological system. And therefore, it's, it, is, it is really something that, um, that uh, I care about but I am still learning about. I don't think I know a lot more. And there are a lot deeper lessons in the way people use technology or sustainability or how they create a social enterprise, et cetera. We are operating in an, at a level where every associate is given the opportunity to care in their own way for the environment, for the community, and for the ecosystems. So I would say that it, it, is, it is a small, incremental way of doing good for the society. And doing good is not philanthropy. It is about being responsible, being clean, being a care for the planet. So doing good in the way we operate, whether it is a spa or whether we buy, the way we purchase or the way we build or the way we manage and the way we care. So it is an overall overarching concept. It's an ethos that is more enveloping than, than mere environmental protection or philanthropy. I'll put it there. KP. I think values are very important to a company if you arrive at those values from your own experience and not from some external source telling you uh, you should 
have diversity and inclusivity, or you should uh, have sustainability, which used to be called mm -hmm. C, etc. And I think in that case, in this particular example, why we have been recognized quite a lot for our CSR and now sustainability is because we, we discovered these um, through our own experience. It was at a time when it was hardly even fashionable to talk about CSR mm -hmm. because of our own academic backgrounds, as I mentioned earlier in development, uh, economic development and social development. So one plank of our slogan, which is embracing, empowering people and embracing the environment, the empowering of people uh, was very important to us. Uh, when we went into uh, places that were pristine and beautiful third world countries, but the local community would get as a monthly salary, a room, room rate. You could see that there's so many opportunities for, for cultural dislocation and social discourse because you would get, you know, these rich white foreigners coming in and enjoying the whole place and these poor villages providing services. So we realized that empowering people and building a community of people was absolutely critical to our sense of social responsibility. And when we saw with Laguna Phuket being basically an abandoned and totally polluted tin mine, and furthermore, when we went to beautiful places like the Seychelles and elsewhere, and we saw how people basically raised down an entire coastline and caused massive pollution of the coastline and the sea and everything else, we realized that we had a responsibility to the physical environment also. At the same time, we saw what was very fashionable in the West, and I'm not trying to say anything negative about Greenpeace or the other groups that are very, very much promoting physical environmental protection. We came to realize that that could not be what defined us. Endangered species are very important, but what about poverty alleviation? And you often have the typical trade-off in economics. You, it's, economics is all about trade-offs, right? You, you Sometimes endangered species are important, but so are people's livelihoods. So we decided to adopt a holistic approach to what we do. And that is to, on one hand, we need to embrace the environment. We need to save coral reefs. We need to do, we need to basically cut down less trees. We have the less carbon emissions and so on. But at the same time, there are many poor communities in the world. And even now you see in the West, a very one-sided debate that Carbon neutrality is all that counts. Stop global trade and only buy local. But what is that doing in terms of trade? If you did all that, what would happen to all those third world economies that rely on global trade in order to survive? And global trade means carbon emissions and so on. So we're digressing into another topic here altogether. But my whole point here is that we adopted our own approach as to what responsibility mean social responsibility means to the physical environment and to the human environment and i the lesson here is every one of you young people out there you should not just embrace sustainability as a slogan and not embrace what is hip and fashionable whether to be local wars or to be this or that you need to look at what you define for yourself and for your values and your goals what is important to you and not just take slogans and and uh, I, I'd like to add here quickly I think I think the word I I was uh, struggled with and, and with many people around us is you know, why are you developing you have to cut down trees and that is totally unfriendly therefore we are in business we are developers we do have to cut down trees but we map out the terrain to see what are the primary forests that we will protect what are secondary that we can cut and regrow. So the key word here for us is restore. When we cut and take away, we restore. That's why our group, we have grown more than 500 over thousand trees where we operate in order to give back. And we will continue to do so to a million and more. And we work with different agencies that do tree planting. We work with other international bodies to look at coral saving. So the second word is, besides restoration, is harmonizing. How do we harmonize all the various factors for development? Who do we care for? The coral fish or the people or the villagers who live on the, at the coastal line? 
who are we supporting the people in the forest? And give, do we give them alternative livelihood? Can we teach them a different skill? And can we grow trees to admit, um, to, to cut down the carbon footprint differently? So that's a lot of restoration and harmonizing work that can go into the sustainability debate and not to just be sloganic about it, that no development, no cutting, and that is the way. That's not true. So our idealism has to be tempered by, I feel, reasoned calculus of, in the end, who is this for? It's for us, it's empowering the people as the primary principle. If it gives jobs, if it creates better value, we'll do it. But we'll restore and we'll harmonize. Yes, absolutely. Um, I think um, both of your commitments to this idea of giving back um, and maintaining um, this very strong notion of sustainability throughout your careers, um, even as Bonnie and Tree has grown so big, um, is a very important idea that you have so so wonderfully shared with our delegates today. Um, and I know we are coming up close uh, on time. Would love to fit in um, a few final questions if possible. Um, Claire, I know you're um, continuing on this idea of social impact advocacy. Um, I know you're very involved with um, the feminist organization AWARE, the Association of Women for Action and Research, um, serving as president and also being a pioneering member of the Diversity Action Committee, um, which was established to increase female representation on company boards. We also have numerous questions about this from the audience too, on um, this idea of gender equality and women's rights. Um, and um, yes, lots of delegates would love to hear about in the workplace um, when you became so passionate about advocating for this um, and how we can work towards reconciling this issue going forward um, with gender equality in workplaces um, and how you overcame potential obstacles um, and wow. challenges as a woman. You're yes. asking me a thesis, Angela. <laughs> <laughs> I think my first dilemma was when I had to make a decision to leave Hong Kong, my master's thesis, and go back to Singapore with KP because he had to mm -hmm. return to attend to the business. And that time the KP's father had a stroke. Or should I stay on, on my own to complete my PhD? Mm -hmm. I was doing it. That was a classic dilemma for a married woman. You follow your husband because there is a calling or you stay on your own and you, know, you never know what would happen next. And of course I followed my commitment to the man that I pledged to. And I left master's degree and came back to Singapore. But I didn't give up. Neither did my supervisor give up. He flew to Singapore and helped me complete that thesis and encouraged me to convert it to a fish day, which didn't happen because the baby came. So I think for a woman's journey, at least in my generation, there are so many factors in life that impact on us. We could not be just uni, unilinear in our development. We could not be just career-wise in that period. You could choose that, but it will be a trade-off on many other things. I chose to let go my master's and return to Singapore. Nevertheless, I got my master's, but at a later stage. I could not continue with my PhD because the babies came. And if I had wanted to, I could have still done it if I want to. So in the end, it is for each woman to ask, and for you young women out there, what is enough for you at this point to lead a good life? You have to define what that good life is. You have to define what, how are you leading yourselves and how do you learn to lead your lives? And what is enough for you? Is a PhD enough or is being a CEO enough or being a $1 million or being a billionaire enough? It is your own definition. So if you talk about gender equality, it's for me, it is about the opportunities. I will take away any discriminatory barriers that allow a woman who wants to do something more. If the woman wants it, I will facilitate, create opportunity to help her, but she needs to define what she wants. And too often, we have not had the courage, nor that audacity, no, given that kind of opportunity or the structures or processes at the workplace to stand up, to speak up, to say what I want. If we do more of that, people will hear you, 
people will help to resource you if it's a good boss like me, and then things may happen. So in the end, I think while the structures, the government policies and the workplace structures, the labor laws can all change in favor of a woman, bottom line is we ourselves as women at the stage that we are in, ask, what do we want? And we look for the resources, the support, the mentors, the patrons to help us move the next step. Take courage to say it. Take courage to be mindful and express it. And take courage to take that step forward. That's the best. The structures are too slow at workplace or in government policies. The processes are still very male. We need to change it. We can't just change the glass ceiling. We have to change the walls, the pillars, the way the house looks, everything. We have to change the way we fashion the workplace. No longer is it enough to just talk about the steel falling or the glass ceiling. We have to smash them all and we do it our way. And with the virtual uh, as, uh, and, and smart people like you all are, you can work anywhere. You can think globally and you can express virtually to so many different communities and you can be what you need to spend time to discover what you want. Yes, absolutely. Um, thank you so much for those words. Um, I think they're very important for many people in the audience today to hear. And I know we are coming up close um, a little bit already over time. Um, you both have such um, <laughs> incredible stories and experiences and we could talk um, on for endless hours about um, all of the insight that you guys have gained throughout your careers. Um, unfortunately, we don't have the time to do so. So sorry we couldn't get to all of the audience questions either. Um, but to wrap up, finally, we'd love to hear any brief um, last words of advice that any of you would have for um, young delegates in the audience um, or just parting words in general that you would like to share, if anything. Maybe. If I, if I could, um, I remember a talk I gave many years ago called Turning Time, which I talked about the various turning points in my own life. That's not important here. I think the important point here is that when I gave that talk and I looked back on the turning points in my life, I didn't actually realize that the turning points don't show themselves as a big light telling you this is a turning point. But in fact, there were moments in my life that were important turning points that I only began to realize afterward when you look back on it. So my only point here to all the young people is that, and, and the, the other point was this, the most important turning points in my life were probably between the ages of 20 to 30. Because I think once you get past 30, you're along your path already of development. I don't say career, because whatever you choose to do in life, after 30, you're kind of 30, 35. It's just a matter of fine tuning whether you want to be an investment banker or you want to be this or that. But the most important life-changing decisions are from probably 20 to 30. And we often don't realize that little decisions you make actually add up to the final person that you are. I, I always recall the famous speech that uh, Steve Jobs gave uh, at, his, at a commencement address where he talked about how, because he took one class in Reed College uh, on uh, calligraphy, that was how he developed um, the, all the many different fonts that the Apple computer had. Um, and how for him, it was like something totally unimportant and sort of you know off the wall that he did actually had an impact on his life. So my final point of advice to all the young people out there is that every moment in your life actually adds on to who you finally become. So that's what I mean about mindfulness, that every moment as you live your life, you make a decision this way, you make a decision that way. Be outside yourself and look back on yourself and say, hey, everything I do is going to make me who I finally become. So don't make random decisions. Don't just do things mindlessly. Do it, everything you do, do it with a sense that you are going to be 
the summation of every small decision you've made in your life. And as long as you realize that, then whatever life you have will be a life of meaning and purpose. I think I need to have a debate with you, KP, about being mindless. I think we can be mindful, <laughs> but we have to be a little mindless, not to use the mind, but more of the feeling. And yeah, my yeah. last word, and my last word for the women here, I, I'm saying to, to you with full sincerity, focus on sisterhoods. Focus on your women fellowships and network. Focus on your friendships and the way you feel about what women can do and we can do it together. Because our conversations and the way we think, feel, must this century add value and create the value to this century. We need the women's conversations a lot more at boardrooms, at courtrooms, at our private rooms, because we need to find that voice. And you, the men out there, the women out there, find your voice for one another and really keep on with the conversations. That's going to make differences matter and you'll not be afraid of differences to create a better world. And you invite us back on our 60th anniversary. <laughs> <laughs> we would love to. We would love to. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yes, thank you so much uh, for sharing all these experiences. Uh, it's truly been um, a pleasure and an honor to speak with both of you. Um, yeah, especially um, being such a dynamic um, power duo. Uh, just really honored to have this time with you today. And thank you so much for um, so generously speaking to our delegates today about all of these experiences. Um, I know I've been deeply inspired and I'm sure many of them have been as well. Um, so yes, um, with that, um, thank you so much, KP and Claire. Um, and we will see everyone soon. Um, take yeah. care. Thank you. Take good care, thank everybody. You. Thank, thank you, Angela. Care.